I'm excited to have Samantha Carroll on the podcast today. Welcome, Samantha. This is going to be a great conversation. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today. Yeah, I think you're going to talk to us about storytelling and how we can better position ourselves as experts. And that's so interesting and something like we were talking about just before we started recording that we really need to overcome and learn how to incorporate in how we market ourselves and position ourselves. But before we dive into the questions, why don't you give us a little background on your Mm -hmm. entrepreneurial journey and how you found yourself as somebody that's just so well trained to help people begin to market themselves yeah. as an expert. Well, thank you, first of all, for that great yeah. intro. Yeah, I'm going to go back 20 plus years and tell you a brief version of my journey because it, it really helps to understand how I came to be here. Mm-hmm. So when I came out of college, I went to work for Comedy Central in New York. And growing up on the East Coast, I I knew that I wanted to go into TV or or movies and do production. And so it was like New York or LA. And being from the East Coast, you know, that the choice was New York as far as my mother was concerned. And so I started working at Comedy Central actually a couple of months before 9-11. So it was a really interesting, bizarre, tragic just life altering time to be in Manhattan. So for Comedy Central, I was working for the SVP of production. We were doing specials and events programming and 30 minute stand up series, which as an aside, I, I get such a kick out of seeing some of these comedians now because at the time they were really not well known, like Steve Carell and Dane Cook. And there's just a ton of them, Mike Birbiglia. Uh, the list goes on and they were just really up and coming. And so it was a really exciting time to go on that journey with these up and coming celebrities. But as much as I loved the creative side of the industry of TV, it was so exciting and just an incredible time right out of college to do it. I really looked around at people who were about 10 years ahead of me. And I had to really look hard for those who had families, who, for those who were married, who had kids and were still taking on this demanding schedule. And I got a little bit of a shock. Like I couldn't find a lot of them, at least in the environment I was in. And I knew that I wanted to be a mom. I knew I wanted to do something creative, but I thought maybe this isn't where I'm going to land long term. So I took a step back. I decided I love strategy. I love business. I'm kind of an academic at heart, but I'm also someone that loves the creative process. And I decided I would go back to school. So I got my MBA at Georgetown University and I focused my studies on strategic communications and marketing. I just took everything (laughs) that I possibly could And when I came out, I went into a really different environment, which was federal consulting. Mm -hmm. And I was doing strategic communications and change management for a very large global consulting firm. My clients were huge federal agencies and I was doing communications planning and group facilitation and so many incredible leaders that I was working with and subject matter experts. And it, and so it really tapped into a little bit of that strategy and communications, but I got pregnant with my first child. I was living at the time right outside of Washington, DC. And if anyone is familiar with the beltway going around Washington, DC, the traffic was a killer. Yeah. So driving 12 miles from my house to work took about an hour and a half every afternoon. And I thought, oh my goodness, how, how am I going to do this with a newborn? So I, again, took a step back, reflected, how am I going to make everything work to where 
I'm going to be really happy. And they were incredible and said, take a maternity leave. You can take an unpaid leave. The door is always open. Come back. So I did leave. I then decided I'm going to dabble in freelance. I'm just going to see how things work out. I'm going to do some writing, some editing. I became editor at large of a parenting website that at the time had won the one of the best daily destinations by Real Simple Magazine. And I was doing the bump watch column, finding great products and resources for moms to be and and parents to be and new parents. And it was great. And organically, I think the more I talked about what I was doing and the more I showed people what I was doing, my business sort of organically grew to where pregnant with baby number two, my husband said to me, you got to just make this an LLC. This is working. You have the flexibility. You're not needing to travel a lot for work. You can be here. And at that point in time, it was the right decision for me. So once upon a brand was built really out of my love for communications strategy, figuring out problems and how to solve them for clients mixed with the entrepreneur side that gave me the flexibility and the network of other women and moms specifically. I joined lots of different networking groups to build my business. And so now we have, I have a brand strategy and communications consultancy that works with my clients who are in my areas of passion, which is healthcare, health and social advocacy, higher education, ed tech, and others too. But I specialize really in those areas. Mm -hmm. I love that. Not only for how you kind of took what you learned and the skills that you had to Mm -hmm. help others kind of grow their businesses and their brands, but you really didn't take a trade-off on how you wanted to be as a mother and a parent and your family. And so many women kind of feel, I think, that they don't have that ability to create their future and create the work that they want to do that works for them. Right. And I will say, it's not for everyone. It can be really hard And you have to have a support network around you that is lifting you up and saying, you can do this kind of like that fuel behind you. And I was, I have been very lucky to have that wonderful support system to be able to do that. And that's also though, why I think mompreneurs, especially there's such a need and such a value to sharing information with the greater community, whether it's resources, whether it's lessons learned, whether it's your expertise. Sometimes you're one tool away or one resource away from just gaining that little bit of progress that you need. Mm -hmm. So making all of those accessible to each other, I think is, is just so valuable. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, correct me if I'm not remembering this right, but you also had this situation where you worked with somebody who wanted you to help them position themselves for a board membership. Mm -hmm. And I find that so interesting in that we have such a hard time kind of creating that copy or presenting ourselves in a way that really gets us where do we want to be and your writing and your communication skills, I'm sure really come into play there. So what are some of the common challenges that we can face when we're trying to position ourselves as experts? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's something that comes up surprisingly, especially when I work with really senior leaders, CEOs of their own company, some of whom are even in the communications industry or adjacent. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to creating this copy for others, it comes so naturally. When you try to do it for yourself, it's a totally different ballgame. It's just a different Mm -hmm. animal because Mm -hmm we start to think, oh, am I bragging? Or wait, did I really have this impact? Or there's some imposter syndrome that comes in. There's some fear or 
maybe you don't remember exactly what the impact was or how much growth you enabled a company to do when you were in it. So what I do, the practice with executives, which is a great, a great thing for, I think there are lessons that we can apply if we don't have access to a consultant also to be able to go through these practices, which is I conduct stakeholder interviews with a client when they're going through this process and they are my subject matter expert. They are the, the expert in their own life. And when we start to dig into a bullet point on a resume and I go through and start to ask these really key questions, follow-up questions around, I don't care so much, a little bit I care, but I don't care so much about the tasks that you did or the responsibilities that you had. I care about the impact you've made and the outcome. And so there's a process where you can actually go through and think about what is a problem or what is a challenge that I encountered when I was doing X, Y, and Z? What's the action I then took to address that? And what was the final impact, result, outcome, success that came out of it? And so you can build this kind of mini story by going through that process and position yourself with your sort of expertise forward rather than your task, your daily task list. And I tell people, and I just did this, in fact, the other week, I said, I was going through a resume with an executive director and all of a sudden this information came out that was big information about an impact that this individual had. And I said, stop hiding the wow. Like this mm -hmm. is your wow moment. And I think for moms in particular and for women in particular, it's very hard sometimes for us to own that we did something great and frame it like that without feeling boastful or apologetic in some way, mm -hmm. I would say my two pieces of advice for this is don't hide the wow and mm -hmm. figure out what the wow is. It doesn't have to, great, if you got an award, if you did got recognition for something, that's mm -hmm. incredible. But if you grew, if you made a huge, let's say you got to your goal that you had set for yourself, mm -hmm. that can be a wow. Mm -hmm. If it's the size of an organization and you did something to impact that organization, that can be a wow. It's mm -hmm. all how we frame that conversation and how we position ourselves. So that's the one thing is, is not hiding the wow. The second is when we tell stories, let's say we go in and we're interviewing for a position, whether it's a board of directors seat or whether it's um, just a job interview. We tend to get really nervous sometimes and go on and on giving more and more details. And what that does is it gives a ton of information, but we lose the story of our impact in all of that fluff. So what's really effective is to come up with one or two, maybe three stories that you practice literally telling, you can tell your husband, you can tell your best friend, mm -hmm. tell your mom over and over again and use those stories strategically. So that let's say you have one story that really shows your expertise in one area. Use that and align it with whatever you're going for. So if it's a board that's in a healthcare sector. Find something from your past that you can create a story around that then aligns really nicely with that position. So it's almost putting a string, <laughs> connecting like two dots, and you want to make sure that it's perfectly aligned when you stretch it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So those are the two biggies, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I love that so much because so often we discount our impact. We don't think yeah. about 
how much impact we do have, or if you're not feeling like you have an impact, maybe you can even incorporate somebody. If you're not reaching out to a coach, which I recommend that you do, Mm. ask somebody that you work with or ask somebody that's close to you, what do you think my impact is? Or is there something that you remember particularly in a situation? Because oftentimes too, we have the greatest impact in things that we find really easy. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And we think that the impact has to come through really tough, difficult work. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think that's a great piece of advice that mm-hmm. I tell people too, is to ask for feedback, right. especially if you don't get something. Mm-hmm. It's having this growth mindset. Mm-hmm. They teach the kids in school about having mm-hmm. this growth mindset and we need to apply it to ourselves too. Mm-hmm. So don't just take a rejection or mm-hmm. a setback as, oh, I'm so bummed. I really wanted this and it mm-hmm. didn't come through. Turn that into, please, could you give me some feedback? Because mm-hmm. what's so interesting is when we ask for feedback, We're assuming they're going to say, oh, well, you didn't have X, Y, and Z. But sometimes what comes back is you are so good at this one area, but we've changed our minds or we've changed our focus or we just couldn't do it at this particular time. We're going to come back to you. Mm -hmm. And so there's feedback even from failure or rejection that is really valuable and then on the other side from success, you're right. There, there are so many impacts that we don't even perceive or understand because maybe someone just didn't share it with us, mm-hmm. or maybe it, it'll come out in a performance review or mm-hmm. some other mechanism, some mm-hmm. feedback cycle. And so I think that what others tell us about ourselves sometimes is really nice and really thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so helpful to, to building us up. It's mm-hmm. it's finding those brand champions, we call it, for mm-hmm. or brand advocates in the brand world. But as individuals, we need to find who those people are too, because they're it's really valuable to creating and positioning yourself with your expertise forward. Yeah, for sure. And I So talking about the stories, so let's say we look back on our experiences and we Mm -hmm. kind of identify a few stories we might want to choose to tell and incorporate, what are some of the storytelling principles we can use to make it effective? Yeah, sure. There's, There's this great term that's called narrative transportation, And what this is, you've probably witnessed this without realizing there's an actual name for it and research behind it. But if you have kiddos who love watching the Disney Channel or cartoons, or maybe they're wonderful readers and they just want to sit and read constantly, and you enter the room and you are calling them for dinner, you're calling them to go do something or clean your room, or let's put shoes on and go outside, and they're not responding to you. They are lost in this world. And I love this term narrative transportation because they are, you literally feel that you are transported. Mm-hmm. And what happens when we tell stories is we are connecting in a way with our audience that really almost no other marketing tactic or strategy does. Storytelling is one of the most efficient ways of getting information across. So I could read a 10-page report to someone, or I could give a snapshot of this idea of the problem action result and convey that same information in a much faster, more effective way. The other great thing about storytelling is that there's something called Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, where we actually, about an hour after we hear a bunch of information, have a tendency to lose half of it, which is incredible. And it's probably, honestly, at this point, 
maybe even more yeah, now know, right? with like, I'm sitting doing this podcast and there's different email pop-ups and things that I have to ignore because they're trying to get my attention. And so storytelling in general is just such a great way. And we see organizations use this all the time. When you watch commercials, you see a mini story. When you watch a movie, it's a story. When we read a, a snippet online, it, it's a little mini story. And then you go on to read the whole article because they've got you right there with a catchy mm -hmm. headline or something. So when we apply it to ourselves, we want to think about who are the characters of our life or our experience that can convey well. So if I wanted to talk about the impact I've had on a client, I could say I worked with this incredible nonprofit hospital in Washington, D.C., and they did X, Y, and Z. And so the client is a character. I'm a character. Anyone I worked with, maybe there was something where I enabled that organization to get more exposure, increase visibility. And so maybe there are other characters I can pull into this story. Mm -hmm. And then we think about well, what was the challenge? What was my impact on it? How did my expertise elevate this organization or these individuals or bring something new to the game? So we think about all of these different pieces of storytelling that create this deeper connection. And what's also great is that stories, the purpose of a story is to engage. So if we think about it from that point of view and we apply it to ourselves, what we're doing is trying to either change someone's mind about us or teach them or inform them about us, but we're doing it in a really digestible way. So that those are some ideas to get you thinking about your experiences and translating it from I wrote reports to I crafted information that informed the greater organization so they could make better decisions. Mm -hmm. There's such a difference in the word choice that we use to convey that impact. Mm -hmm. And I think a large part of that too is also getting really familiar with your audience and who you're speaking with yes. and kind of what their pain points are and mm -hmm. what they need to hear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I cringe sometimes when I'm working with some clients on looking at their website and when I'm reading it, it's very me. This is what I do. This is what, what I've done. And it's, you're just completely leaving out who we need to be speaking to. And so mm -hmm. if we're going to go on a story and we're going to try to engage people, we absolutely need to tap into those pain points that you're there to solve. So whether you're a career coach or a life coach or a wellness practitioner or a teacher, tutor, every single <laughs> job or entrepreneur journey that, that you have, you're there to provide something. Even if it's a product and it's not a service, you're addressing some issue, some pain point, serving some purpose. So you have to dig into, we talk about knowing your why, mm -hmm. which is why you do something, but it's also understanding like the why of what's your audience? What's the reason? Why should they come to you and not somebody else? So unless you're speaking directly to them where they can read and kind of see themselves in the mirror of your language, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that high engagement that you want. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important piece of this. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I know. And it's so hard to think outside of ourselves sometimes. <laughs> it is. It's really hard. And that's where stakeholder interviewing, as we think about that, and we talked about asking others for feedback. Mm -hmm. If you're not clear on what those pain points are, talk to people, mm -hmm. have a little circle of trust. And <laughs> whether whether it's your best friends or colleagues, maybe you used to work with, or 
listen, LinkedIn is like a best friend for the entrepreneur building business because you can reach out to people who you may not have had access to without that social platform. And they're there in a lot of ways because they want to build professional networks. So often it's really helpful just to reach out and say, hey, you've done this for a really long time. Would you be willing to get on the phone with me and share you know, a little bit of feedback? Mm-hmm. And then maybe in exchange, you can introduce them to someone on your side, or maybe you can offer them something in return. Mm-hmm. It's a practice that many of us maybe have heard years ago, mm-hmm. but we lose sight of doing it as we get more and more into our businesses. Mm-hmm. But I think it's so helpful to look at those who have already had proof of concept and done something to get that feedback and say, mm-hmm. hey, what are you seeing as pain points in this industry? Or are you seeing changes? Are Mm -hmm. there new trends I should be aware of and other obstacles that are coming up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so often I think entrepreneurs kind of skip that research in that feedback step that you talked about because maybe we're a little fearful of hearing what somebody's going to say, but it is so valuable yeah. regardless of whether they love your stuff or not, you can always learn yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and then true, I think people feel like in that research phase, they shouldn't be looking at what other competitors or somebody who's a peer is doing for fear of copying or something like that. But that kind of leads me to my next question in that you spoke earlier about sometimes we might feel like a little bit of an imposter or did we really make this contribution? We might kind of feel like fake or so could you talk about how important and the role of authenticity is in kind of crafting our perceptions Mm -hmm. and what we're trying to show to the world to create more opportunity? Yeah. Authenticity is so important and I see it fail a lot. And I'll tell you because interesting (laughs) getting emails constantly from Mm -hmm. these spammy marketing emails that try to connect with you just by putting your name at the top. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on and on. And I know you must be thinking about X, Y, and Z. And I'm always like, you have no idea what I'm thinking because (laughs) I don't know you. And so Authenticity to me is creating something where you are walking the walk. And so what I mean by that is the values that you have in your company, in your brand, you need to then create this greater network where those values are mirrored and aligned with other organizations, other individuals that share those values. If I I have a, a great value for information, for Mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. I try to align myself with others who feel the same way in Mm -hmm. terms of maybe we're collaborating on something or maybe we are just sharing resources. So I think walking the walk is one piece of authenticity and creating an authentic brand. The second is consistency. So You know, if we have a tendency to speak a certain way or represent ourselves a certain way, or we write emails a certain way, we need to carry that through to all aspects of our content. And so our blogs, our podcasts, our social media, they all rely back on that consistent approach. And so that's where kind of creating that brand voice is really helpful, Mm -hmm. maintaining it so that when people come and see all of our wonderful things that we're creating, they come to rely on the fact that we're going to be consistent in the kinds of content we're producing, in how you may be engaging with me, in my tone of voice or my brand voice goes to brand identity too with graphics and creating that authenticity. We don't want to keep switching who we are or the brand representation because it creates a lot of confusion in the marketplace. And that tells people there may be some unpredictability here. 
-hmm. And I'm not sure if this is a trusted source or someone that I want to be engaging with. So I would say those are two biggies in terms of having an authentic approach is Mm -hmm. the consistency piece of it and making sure that your values are aligned to your goals and aligned to others in your greater sort of web in your network. I think that's a really important point because we don't think sometimes we're just focused on one piece of content or one thing that we're doing and not focusing on the bigger picture of the ultimate kind of message or image that we want to project. But then too, I don't think that we often think about the consistency among different types of content that we may be producing because we think consistency is just, oh, I post three times a week or I send two emails a week or whatnot. But there's people who are consuming that are kind of looking for consistency among Mm -hmm. the different types of content that you might be creating. Yeah, exactly. It's how brand reputation gets built, gets Mm -hmm. born and grows up. There's a reason why people go to Forbes to read certain articles or go to Entrepreneur dot com to read certain articles or tap into people.com. Mm-hmm. There is an expected value, an expected outcome mm-hmm. that is fulfilled mm-hmm. by building that really strong brand. And so all of that plays into reputation. And so I think you're right that a lot of entrepreneurs and I think mompreneurs are in their business because that you want to create your business, but taking time in the beginning, especially, Mm -hmm. I think, to think through all of these things that we're talking about, who your audience are, what are these key messages? What do I want my brand voice to be? Is this all aligned? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. If you're putting forth a um, baby toy product or something in the babyhood sector, you don't want to use the same voice that a corporate lawyer is going to use. There's a disconnect there. And so we need to make sure that all of these pieces of the brand story are aligning. And that's what begins to build this consistent reputation. And that's so funny. We have a guest coming up on the podcast who is a lawyer who created a baby brand. A baby product. (laughs) Well, so great. <laughs> but I talking about creating our brand, what are some elements that you think will help our brand stand out? Yeah. So I think that through the process of the brand identity, going through the process of, of connecting with our audiences and doing all of the things that we're talking about, but Coming back to that story, I think is really effective. If you can work in the story into certain social media posts or connecting with different articles online and bringing your story into that, and it gets people to be aware of you. So it increases that awareness. It increases that visibility. And I think just doing your homework, learning how you can differentiate yourself. I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of standing out, especially right now. And I see it a lot with, do I niche down? Do I stay broad? How do I tackle this? And I think the most important takeaway is it depends which is a really hard answer. You can niche down with a story in a specific instance, in a specific situation, but it doesn't mean that your company as a whole has to be micro-specific because what happens is you're then losing out on all of this other business that you want to do. For Take myself, for example. I have clients who are in healthcare and I have clients who are in higher ed. If I am speaking to one of these clients, I'm not necessarily talking about my healthcare experience. I'm talking about everything that relates to education. So I'm differentiating myself by positioning myself really well to that specific audience. And I think that's where you have that opportunity to differentiate yourself, especially in really saturated markets to pull in. What have I done 
that directly is directly and really clearly communicated in this moment. So that's where I would fall back on what are those stories and how do we use them strategically, not just for every situation, but how do I group them? Maybe you have different buckets where you can group, here's my higher ed stories, here are my healthcare Mm -hmm. stories, here are my other stories. And that sort of builds that differentiation over time. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really important and it gets us to be reflective on who we've helped and what our interests are and the clients we love. And that's really important to focus on. Who do you enjoy working with or what kind of projects do you work Mm -hmm. on that you enjoy? So I think that's really important and it can be helpful to think about buckets because Mm -hmm. (laughs) I actually do that myself. I think of, Ah. but I use the example too, when people ask me about niching, it's had I just done a podcast on entrepreneurship, I kind of would have been lost in a sea of podcasts about entrepreneurship, but it's not a podcast just for moms who create baby products. Right. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. But they love it too. It can also appeal to moms who are creating a physical product or just have an online business. It can appeal to all different types. But yeah, just thinking, and it's so hard. I think it's one of the hardest things in business that people really struggle with is how Mm -hmm. and what to niche down on. Yeah. But part of that, and you mentioned it earlier too, a bigger part of our brand is creating networks and partnerships. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that fits in with our brand too? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's a great question and something that's so valuable and something that I have done throughout my career is to think about the strategic partners that we can have. And some of those, we talked about brand advocates or brand champions. Those are great partners to to talk you up to other people, to maybe be your referrers. There's other strategic partners that, for example, with Once Upon a Brand, when I first started out, I was really not doing any graphic design. So I was the messaging and the strategy and the research piece of consulting projects. And what I did early on was I identified complementary partners to what I was doing. So some would say, maybe I was crazy because I was going to some quote unquote competitors and saying, hey, we could work together as strategic partners. You don't really do what I do. Or if you do, I think I can bring a different level to it. I am I can bring X, Y, and Z to it. And as these other branding agencies were developing their business, they would pull me in and continue to for different, different projects that would come up or consulting engagements where they could focus on what they did really well and I could focus on what I did really well. And those two pieces play so nicely together in my industry that it's seamless. I don't have to then compete with them. I'm collaborating. What I think is so great, especially about mompreneurs and women entrepreneurs, is that there are so many opportunities to collaborate. And women, I think by nature, are collaborators. We want to talk through things. We want it. My husband's like jokes to me that someone will have a baby and he'll say, oh, so-and-so just had a baby and I want to know 10 details about it. Well, how much did it weigh and and what's Mm -hmm. its name and does it have any siblings? And he's, I don't know, I'm a guy. That's that's like the answer. And I'm like, no, I know, but I'm your wife. And so you need to know that I want to know all of the information. (laughs) And so it's just, it it can be our nature Mm -hmm. to want to share information, to collaborate. And so I think, It's a wonderful thing to reach out and identify who are those strategic partners that maybe can bring you projects that are tough to bring on your own. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's an opportunity where someone has 
let's take this corporate lawyer who's got a baby product and maybe mm -hmm. there's a publication out there that she reads or she loves, or that would be really interesting to get her product into that. So when we reach out and we create that partnership and say, hey, I can write an article for you. You don't have to do anything. I'll do it. Would you consider publishing it? And I can put a link. There's different creative ways we can think about strategic partners. So mm -hmm. when we do that, what we're really doing is tapping into a new market, a greater audience, increasing our visibility and increasing our, our opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it's so helpful and it does not matter what industry you're in. It's just a useful practice. Yes. So I love that. Yeah, I, it's this conversation is so important to help listeners begin to think differently about how they're positioning themselves and how what their brand is and just yeah. being reflective about and intentional about what they're yeah. doing. So I know you have some resources that would be helpful for listeners. Yes. So talk about that. Yes. Yes. I'm so excited. I have a product that is currently for sale on Etsy, but I know you've been gracious enough to offer it for free. <laughs> and so I'm thrilled that we can put a link out somewhere. Yeah, I know you'll yeah, tell the I'll audience. Put a link in the show notes. Yeah. So it's called the Consultants Brand Strategy Workbook that I put together with a colleague of mine who actually comes from toy design. Mm -hmm. and product design. And she has worked with companies like Crayola and Barbie and Mattel and some of the biggies mm -hmm. to create different products and, and understand the branding behind some of those organizations, coupled with my background in communications, content, research, and stakeholder engagement. We came together and thought about the questions we typically ask when we go through stakeholder engagement Mm -hmm. And these stakeholder interviews to begin the journey of brand development. And so these questions can be useful for a consultant who's in the brand strategy field, who's working with clients to help them develop their brand strategy. It can also just be useful to the individual or to the company who is developing their brand strategy to think through some of these things that we've talked about with intention, with purpose, thinking about the perceptions and the you know descriptors that mm -hmm. we want to use, that we want others to use and mm -hmm. others to think about and how we start building that brand and aligning all of those different pieces. So that I hope is really useful to people. And again, it's, it, it's helpful for them. It can be also helpful for the consultant in this industry as well. Yeah, that sounds like a very useful resource for listeners. So be sure to check out the link in the show notes and, and thank you for offering that. Yeah. So we're coming up a little against time. It's been so interesting kind of diving into this. And I think it's so important anytime we can be more intentional about our businesses and our brands. Uh, if you had a takeaway or a few takeaways that you want to leave in with listeners, yeah. what would that be? I go back and I think about this a lot with myself, which is that I consider myself a lifelong learner and being one and being a mompreneur, I think go so hand in hand. And so my takeaway is be the most curious person in your business. And so dig into the research, look at best practices, read up on the trends, you really need to develop this expertise in order to create a great product for your audience or offer a wonderful service to your clients. And we stop and we kind of halt on that and we forget about asking for feedback or don't engage stakeholders in a strategic brand building, company building way. We really leave a lot of opportunity on the table and a lot of the positioning for our brand is in question. So I would just can I, I would just encourage people to develop the story of their brand by 
incorporating this feedback, by engaging with others, by being open to the information or resources that others have. And then as mompreneurs, especially, I think connecting and building that network is so important. When I, one of the very, very first networking groups that I joined was called Moms Inc. And it was a really small networking group. It met, I think it was once a week or once every other week at someone's business location. We had coffee, we had scones, we would sit around, we'd talk through challenges, we would offer resources. There were speakers that came in and I found it so supportive and easy to ask for help, to ask, have you done this before, especially as a startup? And this was when I was pregnant with baby number one who just turned 15. So Years later, I am still connected to these women and my groups of women entrepreneurs have just continued to grow and grow. And so Mm -hmm. I encourage people to tap into those networks. Yeah. Those are two very powerful tips and it can be so isolating as a mom and a business owner, and especially as an online business owner. And we lose sight of how important it is to really connect with people and exchange ideas yeah. and have conversations like yeah. this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And talk about how are you managing your time even. Right. Those other kind of superfluous mm-hmm. ideas that go along that we think in the back of right. our head. So the right. connecting is really important. No, it is. And thank you so much for connecting with me and being on the podcast. This has been such a valuable conversation. And I loved how yeah. you mentioned we don't really think about, okay, so what if I'm not as intentional as I should be? But you mentioned we're leaving opportunity on the table. And I think that's so important to remind ourselves that we can be missing out on a lot of opportunity by just making a few little shifts in our business. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. I'm sure a listener is going to want to connect with you and learn more about Once Upon a Brand, which I love that name. It's so adorable. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. It's so funny. And I know we're rushing for time a little bit, but the Once Upon a Brand, it's funny. Over the years, people are like, I love that name. I love that name. How did you think of it? And because I was thinking, well, brand strategy and communications, I have four daughters and When I was conceiving, (laughs) literally of Once Upon a Brand, I was reading fairy tales over and over again. (laughs) I kept reading Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time. And I thought, what I'm doing is developing brand stories for clients, for organizations, put the two together and Once Upon a Brand is born. Yeah. So I would love for people to connect with me. They can connect with me on LinkedIn, linkedin linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Once Upon a Brand LLC. I'm on Instagram uh, at Once Upon a Brand LLC. I also have a, a personal site on LinkedIn. So if they look up Samantha M. Carroll MBA, that's probably the easiest way to find me. <laughs> There's a lot of Samantha Carrolls out there. Yeah. And I, and if anyone is interested in inviting me to speak to their team or they think it would be helpful, please reach out. I'm, I'm more than happy to have that conversation. Yeah, that's wonderful. You've really demonstrated that you have a command of this topic and an expertise and and helping businesses incorporate it. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Of course. Thank you so much for having me.